Glasgow Caledonian University. We're in really good company uh, on the fascinating topic of extrasolar planets and um, something that was that has been super interesting, especially the past like couple of decades um, since we've uncovered more and more. Uh, just so you know, um, there will be a Q&A at the end of this. Uh, so have your questions ready. Uh, and I'll let you, Professor Bonnie Steves, uh, get on with the rest. Thank you. Great, thank you very much. Right, I'm going to attempt to share my screen. <laughs> and did that work? And uh, no. No, okay. <laughs> there. Oh, yes, yes, it's working. That's it, okay, fantastic. Well, thank you very much for inviting me to, to this um, lecture and particularly to um, um, for the memory of um, Professor John Brown, who is a, a dear friend of mine. Um, and um, I particularly um, wanted to do this topic uh, because um, I think, well, I, I certainly think astronomy is the best of all sciences. Um, and Professor John Brown managed to make it um, not only science, but magic as well. Um, and I think um, extrasolar planets is one of those um, subjects that um, has kind of um, um, raised uh, people's minds um, since the beginning when you could first look up into the sky and wonder what was out there. Um, and the magic of all of that um, stays with us all the way through with the science um, and through to um, all the strange worlds um, that we're discovering today. So it's a fantastic time to be uh, an astronomer, fantastic time to be interested in the skies. Um, and um, the very first kind of mention of um, extrasolar planets or, or things in the sky, uh, let's just, whoop see how I, oh, here we are, <laughs> different buttons. <laughs> um, uh, the first time that we hear uh, about um, other worlds um, is in writing is Giordano Bruno um, in 1548 to 1600s. Um, and he uh, talked about um, a tale of other people uh, on another world up in the sky. Uh, and he spoke about um, um, the, the stars potentially being like our sun uh, and having worlds around them. Uh, and he was an early supporter of the Copernican theory so that the, the planets went around the, the sun. Um, and he had a lot of also um, heretical ideas um, and the church was not too fond uh, of his um, his religious um, kind of beliefs. He didn't uh, didn't believe in um, in God and and, uh, and and these sorts of things. Uh, and uh, but he what he proposed was there's stars up there. They're fixed in the night sky, and they're like our sun. Wouldn't it be possible that they might have planets like ours, worlds like ours, round it? and that people could be on these worlds. Um, and um, the church had that thought as well, because um, um, if there were people on these worlds, then who was the Pope for them? <laughs> um, so it, there was a lot of um, kind of discourse in that. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, Giordano um, was burned uh, for heresy. Um, so he didn't um, um, manage to survive that. Um, but we have his writings and his first thoughts um, of that worlds, strange worlds beyond our skies. The next time you, you hear, hear of the, the writing of other worlds, um, very famous uh, from Isaac Newton. Um, and he started to try and actually put some science there, mathematics, um, physics um, into following the motions of, of the stars, the planets, um, and uh, started to create um, the theory of gravity. Um, and um, 
Newton's Laws, uh, which is fantastic. And he wrote the Principia. Um, and in there, you find this quote here. And if the fixed stars are the centers of similar systems, they will all be constructed according to a similar design and subject to the dominion of one. So that's the thought of other worlds, those stars out there having planets around them in the same sort of system that we have in our solar system and was philosophizing about that and what that might be like and what would be the kind of laws of science um, to govern that. So we've been kind of um, thinking of um, worlds in other other stars um, um, it's a, sort of the realm of science fiction and, and I first got into astronomy uh, because of science fiction um, and this sort of interest in um, other worlds. And there we used it a lot to um, um, create um, strange new places under different laws. Um, but also new worlds, new societies, and, um, and the, the way those worlds were constructed and the way the people lived there actually had quite a bit of reflection on our own society and our own cultures. Um, so you learned a lot in uh, science fiction um, about your own um, place. Um, and that's kind of um, similar here when we look at um, um, our solar system. It's the only planetary system that we knew for the longest time. Um, and so everything that we knew about um, uh, solar systems, how they were formed, um, how they developed, um, um, how they worked, how they moved, um, was really based on our solar system because that's all we had to go on with this um, thought and um, dream. Uh, of, well, wouldn't it be interesting, there, there might be planets out there um, around these stars, just like we have uh, around our sun. Um, but in my time um, through school, through university, um, that was always kind of up there with, well, and there might be life out there and there might be little green men and aliens and so forth, which was a little bit of a step too far um, in science. Uh, but um, um, very welcome in science fiction. Um, so I have here, um, um, we have this today. So actually this is the, the, the um, um, latest, um, um, his dark materials um, on, on television. Um, and you have the, the other worlds um, beyond in the sky in the Aurora Borealis um, that the Magisterium is looking to um, find out about uh, and this sort of um, quest to look for dust, so those of you that, that know the Philip Pullman stories. Um, and, uh, and so it, it goes on, um, the, the science fiction, but um, in the realms of the, around um, the 1990s, um, the fiction started to become um, real. Uh, and I have here um, a, a summer school that we held in um, Scotland. Um, and it was the first um, summer school uh, in Scotland on extrasolar planets. Uh, and we had people from all over the world coming to speak at that um, um, held on sky. Uh, and it was uh, pretty amazing at that point. Um, we were starting to discover um, quite a number of uh, planets on other um, um, stars. Um, so, but I'm jumping a wee bit. Um, when do we first um, discover um, extrasolar planets? And what are they actually? Um, well, it's basically a, a planet that orbits a star that's not our sun. Um, so extrasolar or exoplanet. Um, and it could be a lone planet, um, dark planet, just um, rogue um, traveling on its own. It could be part of a planetary system. So uh, uh, an array of planets um, like our solar system or one planet um, uh, around the, a, a star, a sun. Um, 
So um, we were trying to find these, uh, but it's very hard because the sun or the star is giving up um, a lot of light and um, burning um, nuclear fusion, hydrogen to helium and various um, things, levels. So it's got a lot of energy that it's giving out. And if it did have any planets around it, um, we wouldn't be able to easily see them from the, the, the closest um, sun uh, being quite far away. And so it's a, a tricky thing. How could you actually discover um, if there were planets out there um, going around uh, the stars that we see in the night sky? Um, very difficult to see with the visible eye or telescope or, um, or, or kind of discover these, um, these um, very small bodies that don't give off that much um, radiation or light um, it, as in they're not, um, not um, burning and producing energy in that way. So how is it possible to actually find planets and um, well they were exploring and looking at the effect that um, the body the the planet a large planet um, or up there near brown dwarfs which are just just barely stars um, producing some energy through nuclear fusion and um, so that kind of size of mass and you can actually um, detect bodies uh, by the effect that they have um, their gravitational attraction. So you've got a visible body, a visible star, and you can see if it has a wobble in it that it must have some mass object nearby um, affecting its, its um, path um, and pulling it uh, along. So you can kind of detect unseen objects um, by the kind of wobble or the anomalies in, in the stars that you can see in their path. And um, so there was a, a little bit of a, a kind of um, hiatus as, as they, they thought they had uh, discovered um, planets um, through the wobble in the nearest stars, uh, but it's very, very difficult in the measurements and, um, and the early, early kind of announcements were actually not correct. Um, although it did turn out to be that there were planets around the star um, that was um, claimed to have it um, earlier on. Um, but you need in science to be able to repeat an experiment. Um, and at that time, it wasn't repeatable. Um, and they discovered that it was um, um, actually noise um, and um, um, very sensitive kind of um, uh, measurements. Um, so it was a, a false positive, as we say. Um, and actually, a big surprise was not um, finding planets around um, a kind of burning star, uh, main sequence star, um, but the very first planets um, that were discovered um, were actually discovered um, around pulsar. And that's what we have here. So here's the, a pulsar is a, um, a neutron star. So it's sort of at the end of the, the star's life and it's a very massive star that's collapsed down um, and um, thrown off in a supernova, um, all of its kind of um, gas and debris and you're left with a very, very hot um, center, very energetic, um, very bright, but very small in size. Um, and um, and uh, its nature, is to have lots of energy going out in the in its poles like this, um, and you can see it um, in various um, radiation. Uh, radiation, um, so um, much like a, a lighthouse. So it, it sort of looks like pulses, um, but it's actually this um, this kind of radiation coming out um, in two beams. Um, as the pulse um, rotates and you start to see the flash like a lighthouse um, rotating. Um, so they were quite surprised to discover um, uh, in that measurements um, three planets in, a, in what is really a, a, a dead star. Um, so it's very unusual 
<clears throat> what you have in this picture here uh, is um, it's showing the um, Earth-like, Earth's um, size um, kind of planet um, and um, the radiation um, energies coming down here along the magnetic field lines. And you can see here um, some aurora borealis uh, forming. So this is an artist's impression of what it might be like um, on these planets um, here. Uh, so, um, so this was a bit of a surprise. It wasn't um, our what we're looking for, our kind of planets like in our solar system. Um, and particularly that that wonderful holy grail of getting uh, an Earth sized planet going round um, uh, a, a sun like our a star like our sun. Um, so uh, that was in 1992, and we're getting closer and closer in our measurements. And the very first star that was um, planet that was found around a star like our sun was 51 Pegasi B. And, um, and you here, here's the picture of the star. And um, you couldn't see the planet. What they were using was a method called radial velocity um, to discover that um, there was a planet there. And how that works is again, you're detecting the um, gravitational um, kind of wobble um, that's placed on the star. So if you look over here, um, here's the star, and um, here's the planet. Um, the star is much more massive than the planet, uh, but there's just enough that the center of mass between the two is slightly off um, center from the, the star's center because the um, planet has a, a gravitational um, pull on the sun. And so the center of mass is it's a bit exaggerated, but it's uh, out here. And so what you have is the sun goes around the center of mass, that star goes around the center of mass, and the planet um, is also going around, whoops. <laughs> Uh, is also going around um, the center of mass. And so what you have, if you're, if you're looking over here, and um, what you see is, is this star is um, alternatively moving towards you and then around and then here moving away from you. And so you've got um, a, a variation moving towards you, moving away from you. And we can take at these great distances um, spectra uh, of the star. Um, and um, there will be um, uh, absorption lines um, to do with the um, signature of the um, composition of, of the star. Um, and what you see is when the star is moving towards you, we have the Doppler effect. Uh, and those wavelengths get um, sh um, decreased um, and you end up with um, everything shifting to the blue side. And so you have um, the spectrum, um, the signature shifting. So this is where it would normally be. And you've got the lines shifting to the blue side. Um, that would be the case if the star was just continuing to move towards you all that time. But because it actually turns in and it's um, orbiting, at some point it moves away from you. And that's where the, again, the Doppler effect means that the, the wavelengths get longer um, and you have everything shifting to the red side. And so what you have is if you're taking the spectrum um, uh, repeatedly, you'll see this sort of shifting backwards and forwards of the lines. And that tells you that it's orbiting um, something. Um, and from that shift, you can actually work out um, um, the, the speed. Um, and um, from all of that, you can get a sense of what is the mass of this planet or this body um, that's um, causing that wobble. Um, so this is a, a method um, that is um, 
very useful. Uh, so it's the first, the first um, star and planet was found um, using this. Uh, and currently we have using this method over 821 exoplanets discovered. So it's the second most um, efficient and effective method of finding um, exoplanets. Um, so I've got, uh, I think, there we go, uh, a, a demonstration of how this works. So here's, here's the, the, the sun um, planet um, and just watch the, the wavelength. So at the moment, it's moving away from us, and now it's starting to come towards us. So the wavelength's turning blue, um, getting smaller, and then going away from us. And you can see it's orbiting a center of mass, as is the planet. So that's how radio velocity methods work. So after this, we started to discover um, quite a few exoplanets uh, just on the, on, the, on the border between being a, a brown dwarf, uh, a kind of um, early star um, of, of lower mass. So it, it does um, burn um, and have nuclear fusion. So that's a brown dwarf. Um, but um, just below that mass, and we get um, Jupiters, um, so often called um, super Jupiters, <laughs> and because they're almost there, they're kind of failed stars, um, didn't quite accrete enough mass to become a star. Um, and um, we were starting to discover quite a number of these super Jupiters um, uh, during that kind of after the 1995 when we first um, um, got our first exoplanet around a, a star. Um, and here's an example of um, when Super Jupiter, this was discovered in 2012, Kappa Andromeda B. Um, and this is an artist's impression. Um, but I have here um, its location. So it's in the kind of um, Andromeda um, constellation direction um, right here. Uh, and this is actually um, uh, discovered through direct imaging. Um, and that's because these are um, massive, um, a bit brighter, they're hot Jupiters. So they're actually, they're not um, burning nuclear fusion producing energy but in their formation, they've got a lot of heat um, and they're radiating that out and gradually they cool down. So that's a lot like our, our Jupiter, but the, these are massive, super, super sized um, Jupiters. So very gaseous planet um, and, uh, and radiating um, infrared um, um, energy. Um, and that's actually how direct imaging you find them through infrared um, kind of um, um, imaging. And this one was um, a telescope in Hawaii. Um, and how they do this um, is, is actually here. So this is, this is a direct image of it. So there, there is the, the planet, Kappa Andromeda B, um, Kappa and B for short, um, and the star is right here. And what they do is they mask um, the star. So all the glare um, is, is removed and they do um, a fair bit of, um, of, of kind of um, imaging um, to remove the kind of um, reflection and glare and, and, and do some processing. Uh, and they're able to then um, allow the actual um, visible uh, image in infrared um, to appear of the planet. Um, so this is really only possible for um, very um, hot in infrared um, planets. 
So um, it's a it's a good way of finding our super Jupiters and hot Jupiters. Uh, and at the moment, um, as of 2020 October, um, we have 51 exoplanets found using this direct imaging method. So, so far, that's not very many. Um, and took us uh, quite a while um, to build things up. We were finding quite a lot of um, Jupiter-sized, um, very strange kind of um, 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 worlds that we were unfamiliar with. So we were starting to get these strange new worlds um, appearing. And very strange um, is, in the, the temperature of these hot Jupiters, and actually that they're really, really close to their, their suns. Um, so they're traveling um, um, around in orbits um, very fast. Um, so very unlike our Jupiter and our solar system with Jupiter quite far out uh, in the solar system. So this was quite a, um, a, an excitement for astronomers and for, um, uh, celestial mechanics, people like myself um, who uh, um, play with the dynamics um, and try to understand how um, such a, uh, a planet could be formed um, and, 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 and stay there and ask questions about, is, is it going to stay there? Did it form there really close to the star? Or did it, did it um, form out in the outer regions and migrate inwards? And what were all the mechanisms for those kinds of dynamics? Um, and we actually had um, real data um, and measurements of the orbits um, that we could start to play with. And we were starting to collect quite a number of different cases. Um, so you can actually move away from the science fiction and the speculation and, and the kind of abstract um, and start to try and model um, the real systems that we were seeing. Um, so those are the two methods so far, the radio velocity method um, and direct imaging. Um, not producing a whole lot. The radio velocity was not too bad, but the direct imaging, very, very difficult. Um, very difficult to see these very dim objects, um, and especially with the star um, flooding um, and overwhelming uh, the images. Um, but the, the really the best method um, is the transit method. Uh, and this is where we've discovered most of our exoplanets. And um, so currently, and we have 3,275 3, exoplanets um, using the transit method. Um, and currently we have, have, have gone over the 4,000 mark. So way back when I first had, um, you know, looked up in the sky and thought I'd really like to be an astronomer. I mean, there were no planets. The idea of that was just, um, was, was the science fiction um, and, um, um, you, you had this secret thought, wouldn't it be interesting? Wouldn't that be fascinating? It should, should surely be the case that there would be planets out there around um, these stars. Um, but astronomers, scientists, you know, um, had, to, had to just leave it there um, until, until we started to have instrumentation and, and the ability, tech, technical ability to actually get to that, um, that measurement. Uh, and now look where we are. Uh, it's incredible. 4,000 worlds um, and, and uh, a multiplicity, you know, planetary systems, many, many um, numbers of them and um, worlds of all different um, characteristics, which are incredible. And so everything isn't just like our solar system. So there's lots to study. So the transit method is a really um, useful way of identifying planets, uh, and um, it was it, it was um, used in our own solar system. So transiting uh, Venus um, to measure um, the characteristics of the planet. And so what we have here is you can actually measure the brightness of the star, um, and 
as the planet orbits around the star, it will start to transit the star and go in front of it. And that is a very small reduction in the brightness because it's blocking out some of the brightness coming from the star. And so you see in, in the kind of light curve um, here, it's not blocking anything yet, um, but at the edge, um, it starts to dip in the brightness uh, because of that shadow um, blocking of the, the, the light. Um, and then it has this characteristic kind of dip um, and then transits the star uh, out the other side. So from that transit information, um, you can actually um, get quite a bit of information um, and um, be aware as soon as you see that kind of signature um, that there is a planet. Um, uh, more sophisticated, you can actually um, start to time these um, and you've got a, another method transit timing variation um, that enables you to actually um, see multiple transiting planets um, and get a sense of their characteristics. And I have here a picture, um, artist impression again, of the um, Kepler Space Telescope, um, which is the, the telescope um, that um, specifically was designed to measure these um, transits. Uh, and so they, um, um, we, it was an, a NASA um, telescope, space telescope launched in 2009, um, originally just for uh, a few, three or four years, um, but it was so successful um, that they um, kept it in operation until it finally ran out of fuel. Um, and it was in operation for nine and a half years. Um, so from 2009 to 2018. Um, and in that time, um, it um, uh, discovered um, around 2,600 exoplanets. Um, so um, amazing, am amazing um, feat there. Um, I just have an example of the um, transit method um, here. So if you watch how this works and you watch the light curve, you can see here it's, you have to look at it face on um, and you start to see the dip as it crosses the star and then back again. So it's really, um, visual um, reduction in the brightness. And that's the sole um, instrument that was on the Kepler um, Space Observatory, Space Telescope. Um, it just had a photometer um, and it continually monitored the brightness of over 150,000 main sequence stars um, and, um, and um, looked for these sorts of signatures. Um, another telescope that did um, use the um, transit method, but also um, used direct imaging um, was the Spitzer telescope. So that's an image of that here. And you can see it was launched long before people um, uh, had, had perfected the you know, transit method and, and um, um, uh, exoplanets um, being really prevalent. Uh, it was actually launched as an infrared um, telescope um, and it was it had a lot of um, different things that it was um, planned to do <clears throat> as well as um, look for exoplanets um, in the infrared. Um, but in that, um, they realized that they could redesign some of their, their kind of um, experiments there um, and enable it to um, actually use the transit method as well. Um, and that you can see 2003 to 2020 just recently was an incredible um, kind of time span for uh, a telescope that originally didn't have that intention um, and it produced quite a, a lot of um, um, good um, results of exoplanets. 
and in particular one that you'll see um, later on, a um, very famous one, the Trappist one um, with seven planets around it. Um, and the next slide, whoops, next slide, we'll show you how, um, how the transit method looks when you have um, multiple planets or a planetary system. Um, so you can see the signature. So again, as soon as one of the planets crosses, you get the reduction. So that's a, a clear transit of one planet, another one, and then two at the same time. So you get further reductions and then kind of coming out of it. So these kind of signatures tell you that you've got um, more than one planet um, and that they're kind of transiting across uh, the star. And so those telescopes were, were able to pick up um, that sort of um, kind of measurement, um, which, is, which is incredible. So the transit method became uh, really, um, really powerful. Whoops. <laughs> There we go. Um, and um, here's an indication of how rapidly um, people started to be able to find uh, exoplanets using the, the trans, uh, transit method. Um, so the deep blue, um, those are discoveries um, early on um, not using Kepler. So this is all the, the, the wealth of the Kepler mission that went on for nine years, nine and a half years. Um, and over that time span, um, the, that um, telescope observed 530,500 stars, um, detected 2,662 planets, uh, but it's still, uh, it, it's now not, in, um, not working anymore. Uh, but we're still finding um, exoplanets from the data that it sent back. Um, so it was just taking photometry data. Um, all that data was sent back to Earth, um, sent back to the, the um, mission um, and is being analyzed. Um, and that's where you detect um, those kind of reductions um, uh, in the, um, the light signature. Uh, and um, they're creating new techniques and new algorithms, um, better ways of, of uh, analyzing the data. Uh, and so we're still detecting exoplanets from um, Kepler's data, which is pretty incredible. So we're sitting at about 2,700 something exoplanets from, from the Kepler mission. But you can see here how it, um, it started to um, grow and um, there was um, a slight um, mission problem with um, um, Kepler. <clears throat> so it, that's why you've got Kepler and then K2 discoveries. Um, so the, 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 it was originally um, um, directed and, 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 and looking at um, a fixed field and, and um, some of its directional kind of um, um, uh, instrumentation um, failed, um, but they re, re jigged it and reshaped it and actually changed its mission um, to exploring um, for habitable planets uh, around um, very dim red dwarfs, um, which is something that we could probably detect. So you've got a very dim star. And um, so it's not that difficult to kind of um, um, uh, then explore um, smaller and smaller um, planets um, in that area. And that proved very, very worthwhile. Um, okay. Um, so we have those three methods. They're the, the, the main ones. So the, the radio velocity method is the second most um, Productive, the the um, uh, the transit one producing the most, um, and we had direct imaging giving us some um, um, fifty or so, um, and the other one we have is the microlensing, uh, and this is um, um, 
this is where you're actually um, the, using the gravitational lensing. Uh, and so you've got a, a star in the foreground here um, and it passes in front of a, um, a, a background star. And in that, um, the brightness is augmented, but at acting um, as a gravitational lens. Um, and so you see um, when, when the star passes, um, the background star, you see an increase in brightness um, because of its um, brightness there. And the same thing happens um, when the planet, if there's a planet going around that star um, and it um, has a gravitational lens effect, um, then when it passes the background star, you get an increase in brightness and that's due to the planet. So if you see that kind of signature, um, then you've got uh, a planet, um, an exoplanet for that star. So that's another method of, of detecting um, exoplanets. And here we have the kind of sum total. So you can see how effective each method is. Uh, so the radial velocity is, is the blue. So this is the, <clears throat> the numbers that um, they're finding in each method per year um, up to 2014. Um, and, um, and you see that the radial velocity um, is, is um, not as numerous as um, the transit, the green it is starting to take off. Um, and microlensing is um, just a small number there and likewise direct imaging. Um, so this is, the, this is the, the premium method of finding exoplanets. And here's our total numbers. Um, in October 2020. So I think it's uh, amazing. It's incredible um, that um, we've gone in my lifetime from no planets and the thought of it being science fiction to finding them um, and, um, and having over 4,000 exoplanets. Uh, and, and each one of those getting the, the measurements of their orbit, their mass, their temperature, um, measuring, um, you know, beginning to measure the atmospheres. Uh, so an incredible richness uh, of, of information and characteristics of all these um, strange worlds. Um, and identifying not just one planet around the suns, um, but uh, planetary systems, um, solar systems. And so you have, um, and binary systems. Yeah, so really fascinating dynamics um, coming into play um, with, uh, with these exoplanets that we're discovering. So this, this gives you the kind of um, array of different um, uh, characteristics that we have. Um, and um, and you've got um, each one of these is a is a a, a planet so plotted on here um, with distance from their star uh, down there um, and this is the kind of um, uh, size in radius of the planet uh, that we have um, and uh, and what's really interesting um, is on this kind of scale. Uh, you can see um, a kind of desert, um, which is around the Neptunian kind of objects, um, so called the hot Neptune desert uh, in this. Um, and the closer you are to the star, the hotter it is, so that hence the hot and warm um, directions and coloring. Um, and um, here's the total of the um, different categories of planets that we've discovered um, so far. 
so a lot um, in the large mass or large size area because they're easier to um, find. Um, but we're starting to find um, quite a number of um, Earth um, Earth sized um, planets, which is really exciting. Um, and uh, around um, stars like our sun, which is even more exciting. <laughs> so, um, so that we're starting to see um, characteristics in the planets that are um, similar to things that we know. Um, but we also are finding lots of very strange, um, uh, wonderful worlds um, in, in these um, Jupiters, gas giants, um, Neptunian sized worlds, um, super Earths. So that's um, uh, kind of size between Earth and Neptune. Um, and looking at their characteristics. Um, and in all of this, um, when, you, when you looked at um, the, the numbers that we have um, of these that we're finding um, in the Kepler mission, for example, you can do a kind of extrapolation, sort of the probability of finding um, uh, these kind of um, types of planets um, in, in the scale in our galaxy. Um, and um, looking at the statistics, of the, the richness of data on planets that we're getting from all these different um, telescopes, but particularly a few studies with the, the Kepler ones that with, with the, the common um, method, transit method. Um, and they estimate um, that, uh, that there are probably uh, around something like 40 billion Earth-sized planets orbiting in hab habitable, habitable zones of sun-like and red dwarf stars in the Milky Way. So that's um, quite a lot of opportunity. And um, so to, to actually um, perhaps have life as we know it. <laughs> so that's becoming a, a, a real study, astrobiology, life in the universe, um, real feasible once you start to see that planets are actually very common, um, which I, I always had a thought that surely they must be um, just as common as stars are in, in the sky. So it's really wonderful to see. Um, but you also see some really interesting features where they're very rare. And so in this um, picture here, you start to get a sense of why are the planets the way they are um, uh, in the dynamics that they're in. Um, and that tells us a lot about how they form and evolve and how uh, planetary systems form. Um, and so it's very strange that we discovered um, so our Jupiter, um, hot Jupiters. So these are um, masses, um, sometimes um, quite a bit more massive and gianter than our Jupiter. Um, and they are very close to their sun. So these hot Jupiters have very strange um, characteristics. Um, temperatures, um, um, thousands of degrees uh, and um, periods going around their star of 18 hours as 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 small as that and so again it's it's really interesting how did they form did they form there um, and are they going to migrate out and um, you know we're, we're sort of looking at our own Jupiter and seeing that it's quite far out in the solar system and um, so is that something that these hot Jupiters um, would be um, doing in their evolution? Or did they start out, out here and migrate in? Um, and so lots of um, fun dynamical um, puzzles to, to um, play with as we gain more and more um, data and characteristics of these orbits of the Jupiters. So that's fascinating. And then the Newtonian, um, exoplanets. And um, so we've got 1,458, again, quite a number. And these are um, 
like our Neptune and Uranus. Um, so they are helium, hydrogen, but have rocky kind of um, uh, elements to it. Water, ammonia, methane. These are the sort of um, uh, compositions of them. But they are, you can see, mostly out here um, and not here. And so it's quite strange when you when you're just that kind of bit smaller, um, there's quite a, a difference in in the kind of um, characteristics. So these are typically icy planets and um, far away from the the um, the sun. Um, and hot Neptunes are very rare. <clears throat> so we we kind of have to think of some dynamics or some um, evolution formation kind of theories and models to explain that. Um, so that's a, a fascinating question uh, people uh, are exploring and, and modeling. Um, so, uh, and then we have our super earth and we don't have any, any, any planet like that in our solar system, um, but they are, um, equally common <laughs> as Neptune, Neptunian worlds and gas giants. Uh, and um, super Earths are um, more massive than the Earth, um, but lighter um, than uh, the ice giants like Neptune. Um, and they are um, possibly um, gas and rock uh, mixture. Uh, and they are kind of in a range uh, between two times the mass of the Earth and ten times the mass of the Earth, um, and and that's um, apparently very common amongst our exoplanets. Uh, once we got our instrumentation down to start to discover these, and um, so they're fascinating. Um, and then our Earth-sized um, planets we're starting to start to um, gather them. And they range from um, 0.5 an Earth radius up to two times an Earth radius. And they are rocky planets um, like our Earth, silicate, water, carbon, um, that sort of competition, um, composition. Um, so here's an example of some super Earths um, discovered in, the, um, in this system here. Um, and this was, um, this is um, in the southern constellation Pictor, so 73 light years away from us. And they discovered three planets uh, in this um, um, system. So it's an M3 type dwarf star. So we're seeing a lot of um, being able to um, discover planets in, in the kind of um, dim stars. And uh, so, and, and this one is very strange because uh, what's formed there are two super Earths um, and an Earth, um, 1.25 Earth radii. So that's an Earth size uh, planet. Uh, and they're very close. Um, if you look at their orbit, 3.4 day orbits, 5.7 day orbits, 11.4 day orbits. So these three planets are very close to each other and also close to the star. So that's really different from our solar system. And you kind of wonder, how is that possible? And here's an example of Earth, 365 day orbit uh, around the sun. Um, and in our solar system, all the planets are very well spaced out um, from each other um, and not really close in. Um, so, this is a, a really fascinating uh, planetary system. Um, this one was um, discovered again by the transit method, but actually by um, a new telescope set up in TESS, which is Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite. So the survey of exoplanets using the transit method um, goes on even though the Spitzer telescope and the Kepler um, telescope have uh, finished. Um, it's a, a really important um, uh, topic and, and um, uh, experiment um, in astronomy. 
Um, so that, that continues. Um, what people are most fascinated, I think, are um, by getting to the Earth type planets um, and particularly um, understanding and discovering if any planets of Earth size are in what we call the habitable zone. Um, and this is um, um, the, the region. So here it is in this band. Um, so this is our sun and our solar system planets. Um, and the habitable zone you can see um, has Venus, Earth and Mars in it um, with Earth right in the center. Um, and it's the region um, connected to distance from the star and the, and the energy of the star um, in which um, you can have liquid water on the surface of the planet. Um, so that's, um, so it's, it's neither too hot um, and it all turns into gas um, or too cold and it just turns into ice and you get icy planets. So um, um, rocky planets with, with no water all burned away in the inner bit um, and icy planets out here. And just in the habitable zone, you have the potential for water um, to lie as liquid form on the surface. And that's the, the um, ingredients for life. So that's why people are, are very interested to see any Earth-sized planets in a habitable zone for the star um, that you have. And here is an example of Gliese 581. And uh, so again, it's a red dwarf, um, dim, dimmer star. Um, and they discovered um, quite a number of planets around it. So what have we got for six in, in this system? Uh, and um, again, the, the habitable zone is closer uh, because this is a cooler star. So uh, you need to be closer to have the same temperature. Um, there and you've got a, a number of planets that are in that um, kind of habitable zone. So this is the 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 holy grail people are looking for um, to to see um, planets that are in this habitable zone, Earth-like, um, and even better around a star like our sun. Um, and then we're getting really close to um, similar. Um, situation for life to start um, as we know it. Um, this is often um, coined the Goldilocks zone uh, because it's neither too hot nor too cold and just right. <laughs> so it's quite a nice um, uh, phrase. So um, here is all of the habitable worlds discovered in the 2000 exoplanets at the time this was um, recorded in 2011. Um, so we had 2000 exoplanets. Keep in mind now today we have 4,000, over 4,000. So that's 10 years on. Um, and we were discovering habitable planets um, and um, a whole range of these. Now, these were, you can see comparison of the size. So in 2011, um, these are, are kind of bigger than Venus um, in size. A lot of them are, are quite large um, and a few are getting up there kind of Earth size. And if we just move a little bit forward in time um, to 2015, uh, we're now down to small habitable zone planets. So Earth size, and you can see there's Earth uh, as a comparison. Um, and so uh, in 2015, what we've got uh, six, eight really good candidates all in their habitable zone. Um, area and of Earth size. Uh, so they're starting to become 
common. Um, so, well, common-ish. Um, this is uh, this is eight out of the um, uh, one thousand planets found. Um, so they're they're um, and some of them they're all less than two times the size of the Earth. All of the stars, all of their stars are cooler and smaller than our sun, because uh, that's where uh, we can um, more easily detect them. Um, so um, as we improve our um, instrumentation and techniques, um, we're getting closer to, um, to Earth, Earth size, um, and being able to look at stars like our sun. Um, so this is the this is the in 2016 and 2017 checking it and confirming it. But this was really a, a, an amazing uh, discovery of seven planets, um, and these are artist impressions of them of what they might look like um, and what their composition might be like, um, given the, the characteristics that are measured um, for them. Um, and um, and this, is, this was measured by the TRAPPIST um, telescope, which is transiting planets and planetesimal small telescope in Chile. Uh, and the system was named after that telescope that found it. The star is a small dwarf star. Um, it's an M-type star and it's 0.89 solar masses. So 0.89 times um, the mass of the sun and it's 0.12 um, the sun's radius. So smaller um, and less mass uh, and fainter. Um, but for, that enables us um, through uh, transit photometry to actually see these or measure these planets uh, and was first discovered was the three Earth-sized planets, which was um, great, B, C and D. So these were discovered first um, and we could easily, we could start to, there's so much data now collected on it. We, were, we now know all the characteristics of their orbits um, and um, masses and density uh, and such, which is why the artists can start to uh, make guesses as to uh, its appearance. Um, so we really know quite a lot about this, um, this planetary system. Um, not quite as much as we know about our solar system, but this system is, is, um, is the next um, up on our list in terms of um, knowledge that we've um, got from it. So it's, it's really, um, really fascinating to, to explore that and the dynamics. And it's quite different from our solar system um, there. Um, but it has some dynamics that are similar. Um, so we recognize those things. So for example, um, these two planets here are locked tidally locked to the star. So they always show the same face um, to the star. And so you see this picture here for these two, there's a, a terminator shadow um, location. Um, and on this side, um, you've got the sun energy and on this side, it's in shadow and it's permanently like that. So um, they, they can explore the the temperature differential between the two um, uh, on either side of that terminator. Um, and it's, it's quite extraordinary. But that's a, a dynamical feature that we have. We're familiar with that tidal locking and um, because our moon does that. Um, we only see the one face of the moon. Um, so the man in the moon <laughs> um, side and the, and the dark side of the moon, um, we don't see. Um, so that kind of um, mechanism is, is physics. It's, it's, it's the air we understand it. But it's really interesting to see what are the ramifications on the features of the planet and the characteristics um, of, of its geology and, uh, um, and its, um, and its uh, um, kind of... Um, um, I suppose climate um, 
might be the right word, <laughs> variations in temperature and, <laughs> um, and, and such. Um, so um, comparing it with our solar system, you can see quite a big difference in that this Trappist system is all very close to its sun. Um, so it's, it's, it's all in here. So you've got, sorry, my light shining on it. <laughs> you've got um, um, 25 times enlargement uh, on this scale. So that's pretty extraordinary. So this system is actually um, more closely um, in, its, uh, in its appearance and its array to Jupiter and, and its major moons um, in its kind of spacing um, and closeness. And so that is all the, the moons um, and, and I look at all the strange worlds um, and we're starting to explore the kind of dynamics of these things and trying to explain the evolution. Uh, and um, so I thought I would just give you uh, a little um, kind of um, demonstration of some of the dynamics um, problems that, that we work on. And so this is um, uh, a problem that um, Professor Archie Roy, who some of you might know from long time, uh, and myself um, as Celestia Mechanics, um, we um, worked on this and discovered this problem, which is a four body problem. So, um, and we've um, since, um, I've just recently um, turned it into a five body problem. And so it can be a, a, a planetary problem. So the fifth body is just sitting at the center and then there's symmetry. So this could be um, five stars. It could be a various uh, arrays of, of planet and stars. So this could be a, um, a star and a planet um, and there's symmetry. So a star and a planet could be that you've got a planet in the center or a star. Um, and we're just looking at the symmetrical motion of this. Um, and this central body is fixed there. So it's a little artificial, um, but in doing this kind of dynamical um, study, um, you can actually find um, um, orbits um, and, and situations where um, it's actually quite a stable um, configuration. And so that's what um, Archie and I did. We, we um, had a lot of fun playing around with this problem and we set it up deliberately like this because we discovered um, if you had all the velocities perpendicular um, to this line of, of, of them all in a row um, that um, everything after that, all the motions, as long as you had symmetry, this mass is the same as that mass and this mass here is the same as that mass. So you've got a kind of symmetry that the motion, once you set it going, is always in a parallelogram. So it's always um, in this shape like that, um, which is really quite nice. Um, and, and it enables a lot of simplification in your kind of analysis. Um, uh, and it's, it's pretty amazing to think that this complicated system of four bodies or in a fifth body at the center um, could actually um, move in that very symmetrical uh, way. And I've got a little movie to show you. Let's just see. Um, what you see is that there are only four states that you can be in. Um, so um, you can be, so center mass here, you can have um, uh, a binary uh, and a binary here. So they're basically orbiting here and, and this is paralleling that here. <clears throat> and you've got um, two arrangements. So these are both binary systems um, going, whoops, <laughs> going round each other here uh, and this one going round each other here. Um, and the other one is um, is a system where uh, they go 
um, round the center body. So this is a pair that goes round the center body. And then these ones go round like that. And they always maintain this parallelogram. And this is the other pair where you've, you've switched the body. So just keep that in mind. I'm going to whir whirlwind you through this, um, this, uh, this strange uh, planetary system. Um, and uh, you can see it in action um, in a very early um, uh, movie that we made, which I still like to show because it's, um, it's there. So here, here is, watch the colors. And um, so you've got the blue matching um, and the center of mass or that planet that's fixed at the center is sitting right there. Um, and the stars on one side, the diamonds on the other side, and just watch how they move. So stars together, whoops, now things have changed and it's stars and diamonds together. You can see it's, it's a bit jumping, but it's parallelograms that they're moving in. So this really does, all the mathematics that we were modeling there really does happen. Um, and you can see the, um, the motions. So that's, that could be a four body system um, or a, a, a planet or, or a star at the center fixed. Um, if the center body is large enough, um, then that starts to become stable. And, and let's, let's, next one. Um, and um, I, I just throw this up because we originally called it the Caledonian symmetrical four body problem. And, and now just recently, Caledonian symmetrical five body problem. Um, and um, we named it after uh, my university, uh, Glasgow Caledonia University, where we were working at the time. And we also named it after Scotland. Um, so that was, um, that was ours. There, there's a, a precedent for that. Um, there's a, another um, dynamics problem in celestial mechanics called the Copenhagen problem. And it was named after um, the, the location where the people um, kind of played around with it and first posed it um, um, uh, to um, be used as, as a kind of puzzle. So this is the first four body problem that actually has an analytical solution. Um, and while we were working on it, this became the analytical solution. So it's just where motion is confined in this, in this space. Uh, but when we produced it, so each of these four possible uh, arrangements in, uh, are in each one of these tubes. Uh, and when we drew it all out, and we had to do this by hand because we didn't have um, sophisticated graphics, 3D uh, things at the time. Um, and uh, when we drew it out, we thought, you know, it's a Caledonian problem and those look like bagpipes. <laughs> So we called them the bagpipes, the regions of allowed motion. Um, so that's our, our model. Um, so you saw it in action. Um, and then just a few years ago, um, uh, people were um, studying um, the dynamics of double binaries and exoplanet systems. Um, and they made this movie. Um, so this isn't my movie, but I was looking at it. I thought, you know, that looks very very similar and um, so i'm hoping it's going to work so it really pays to look at a simple problem that has symmetry in it this doesn't quite have symmetry but you start to see um motions um, that are quite similar to the ones that we were studying in the simple case. So they're all gravitationally bound. So this is, this is an exoplanet system um, around some binaries.
and hopefully I can good I can get rid of that and my final slide um, is in honor of John Brown um, and this is um, an artist's impression of Trappist One um, that planetary system of seven planets um, and um, um, John Brown, well, he was an artist himself, uh, but he um, had just brought out his book, Ur Big Bra Cosmos. Um, and in there is an excellent chapter on the latest things on exoplanets. So I highly recommend get his, get his book um, and um, have a, a read of that. Uh, and um, it was um, written uh, jointly with his um, uh, longtime um, friend Rab Wilson, who is a poet, um, and I've just pulled out um, one excerpt from the um, the poem um, in the chapter on exoplanets. Um, I will try to read it out, but I'm Canadian, <laughs> so I really make a mess of things. Uh, but I think it's it's quite um, quite a good one. So, the Goldilocks zone. Will hey look. I, that yin, Trappist one, mind, strang magnetic flares to juke. That stellar winds that burn. And that's what you have when you have the planets so close together and so close to the sun. It's not going to be a very nice place to live. <laughs> and I'll finish there. Fantastic. That was amazing. Thank you so much. The visuals were great. I'll definitely go back to see them. Um, all right, and good poetry reading. <laughs> I need to practice struggling. that a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Um, all right, so just a little reminder that people who will appear on the gallery view will be recorded and on YouTube. So once again, if you're camera shy, feel free to, to move away. If not, we're happy to have you here. So we'll move on to the questions. And um, we're getting a lot of thanks in the chat. Uh, and we see uh, some questions already. Uh, Alistair, I'll let you ask your question yourself. OK, thank you. Um, uh, thank you for that talk, uh, Bonnie. That was that was thoroughly interesting and uh, a wonderful poetry reading there at the end, too. <laughs> um, I had a, a question, or a, a few questions. Uh, first question was, how common are these four and five body systems so um, it's actually quite um, common to have binaries um, and quadruple uh, systems. So um, we 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 were, we're worked out some numbers. I can't remember what they were, but we found that the, that there were quite a large um, number. If you look at all the kind of stars in our galaxy, um, and you looked at the prevalence of um, of clusters, um, stellar clusters, and um, that four bodies. Um, and, and that kind of size um, are a lot more common than you think. And, and binaries are a lot more common, which is why um, people started studying exoplanets in binary systems. Um, so that's a, a, a big thing. And so I'll, I'll just jump that into four body systems. And um, the, the, the specific symmetrical four body system. So that, that movie that you saw there at the end, that's a, a movie of a real system. Um, that, that they've um, discovered of, of four, um, four, four bodies moving around. Um, and so that was a simulation of that. To get a symmetrical system um, is not so easy, uh, but we, um, we, we put it out to our, our astronomers, our observers, and um, we worked out the light curves for our symmetrical four body um, system. Um, and the, the eclipsing. So we've got a whole host of um, light curves that were out there and, and it's, it's an open thing. So first person that discovers light curves that look like that, to, that would be fantastic um, to, to actually have a symmetric four body system like that. But it, it, it is possible because there's certainly stable areas um, arrangements for it. So I'd love to find one. <laughs> Thank you. Great. Um, and I'll just say for people who are putting questions in the chat, feel free to write out if you want to speak out loud, 
because of course you can uh, ask your questions out loud. Um, but we have uh, the next question is from Ed Tobias. And it is, is there any current method that can detect liquid water on exoplanets or is such a method being developed? Um, liquid water. Um, what we're, what we, we are detecting or starting to detect is, is um, through this uh, spectroscopy, spectroscopy is the kind of atmospheres. And so we can detect um, kind of water vapor um, compositions. So um, yeah, uh, we, um, liquid water, not so easy, <laughs> but, but at atmospheres, um, we can start to see that. And, and again, um, you, you get some of that measurement in the, in the um, um, kind of um, spectrums and, um, and a bit in the transit method as well. You can start to see some of the, the kind of atmospheric signatures. So that's kind of the, the next area of exploration is, is to be able to explore um, those atmosphere signatures and start to look at the chemistry uh, of the atmospheres. So certainly water, water vapor um, is in the, in those um, signatures. Yep. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Um, we've got um, a question from Robert Law. What is the closest habitable exoplanet to the earth? Thank you, Robert. That's a really good question. I, I don't know, actually. I was trying to think if I came across that. Um, um, I think I did. Um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, in the habitable. Yeah. Um, I'd have to look at the list. It's always nice. I'm just checking to see if I have had any note of that. Um, closest to the Earth. Um, Nope, I'm afraid not. We'll have to look up in the tables. <laughs> um, I can I can direct you. There's um, a whole um, host of um, catalogs, and so they're open access. So please do go and and look up the open open access catalogs of all the um, exoplanets, um, and and then tell me the answer. That would be great. <laughs> great. Um, and uh, I missed John's question, who asked before Robert Law, actually, so sorry about that. Um, have they detected any planets in other galaxies? Um, that would be very difficult. Um, we're really looking at the stars that are closest to us, and so the transit method. Um, so um, to be outside our galaxy, um, wouldn't that be something? But I think that will be a, a long, long time. I think we'd have to be able to travel <laughs> um, some distance to be able to do that. So yes, um, very, very difficult. We're really only seeing um, um, kind of um, in the vicinity that's nearby us um, uh, within galaxy. So. All right, great, thank you. Uh, we've got a question from Julian Gibson. Um, with, uh, all right, so it is, is it possible to use spectroscopic methods to determine the atmospheric composition of exoplanets? And he says, excellent talk. And I think there's another question after that, but we can- Okay, um, could you repeat that one again? I yeah. almost... Sorry if the pronunciation is wrong. Is it possible to use spectroscopic methods to determine the atmospheric composition of exoplanets? Um, yes. Yep. Yep. That's, that's just on the edge. That's what, what people are starting to do. Um, so that's really exciting because now we can actually um, get a sense of um, atmospheres um, and um, those, um, and, and we can see, see clearly to surfaces uh, of rocky planets um, that don't have atmospheres. Um, so it's it's um, really interesting, fascinating times. Um, yep. Great, and there was another question from Julian. Does the GIAA mission astronomy data provide a way of detecting exoplanets, please? Yeah, there, there is, as, astrometry is also another way, yep. Um, so, um, that is not as um, 
uh, um, well as common um, and hasn't produced as many, uh, but there that is certainly another method. Yep. Yeah. All right, great. Um, Alistair, um, I'll just read the question. Um, are you excited about the Gaia data release today? I've missed that. What happened? <laughs> I believe it was Gaia's third data release today. Oh, um, today's yeah. actually a big today's a big day. Uh, uh, but a few milestones today. Um, five years since Lisa Pathfinder was launched, which is relevant yeah. to my place of work. But yeah, but, uh, we were swamped by the Gaia data release. Um, Fantastic. So tell us about it. I, I haven't seen it yet, but oh, okay. uh, Pathfinder was a success uh, <laughs> yeah. five years ago. Excellent. Um, I, I have one question. Uh, was um, Would you be able to provide um, a list of possible systems for keen amateur astronomers to look for in the night sky? Um, for looking for exoplanets? At, yes. Yeah. Um, can I just say, isn't there the Planet Hunter project yes. by Chris Lintot, where you can see those dips in light uh, and any Paris, any member of the public can uh, participate, right? I was thinking you might want to start by um, repeating something, you know, so trying to trying to get your instrumentation um, and, and try and repeat um, um, ones that have been found. Yeah. So I, I would, I would actually go to the, um, to the catalogs um, and just have a look and, and see. So it just depends what sort of equipment you've got um, there, but yeah. All right. Thank you. Um, thanks. Uh, and then from Vincent Bryson. Uh, hi there, Bonnie. What do you expect to come next in the exoplanet field? But more importantly, what do you hope comes next? Um, I'd really like, um, I, I, I think that the astrobiology, um, I, I just think that's fascinating. Um, even life, um, uh, all different forms uh, of life um, uh, and um, that exploration within our solar system. Uh, but um, some of these um, um, sort of um, planets and the atmospheres and the signatures, it's just, you're just getting that much closer <laughs> uh, to, to be able to um, see um, uh, and, and learn more about life um, and how it's developed and evolved and, and such. So um, I think that's fascinating. I'm not sure that we're going to hear any uh, aliens um, coming our way <laughs> um, in, in all of that, but, um, but I, I just think it's, a, it's amazing. We, we cannot be an aberration, you know, so the, all these planets um, have to be producing, um, um, you know, just, just like the stars um, had to have planets around them. And now it's just so common. And um, it's fascinating to think uh, what sort of life forms and life might be developing um, in these regions. So the, 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 this, the search and the exploration and understanding of, of planets in habitable zones um, around um, all these different types of stars. I just think that's just um, fascinating. Um, and then the dynamics of all of that. So again, how, how fortuitous is our solar system to be the way it is um, so that it uh, enables life to, to um, develop and be sustained um, is, is incredible. Uh, so it's just, it's understanding those dynamics and if there's something special in the solar system in, in its arrangement, but to see it duplicated or, or repeated or, or having different forms um, in other planetary systems is just really fascinating. So I think that's, that's, um, that's what excites a lot of people. <laughs> All right, great. And um, thank you. We've got a question from YouTube. 
uh, from Tony Larius, and it is regarding the video at the end. What can happen to those planets every time they swing around where those other stars are near? The very last um, video. Yes. The, yeah. the plant. Yes. So, um, if um, well, it's it's uh, it's the same in that kind of last artistic picture. Um, you get quite a lot of, um, it's not a very good place to live. <laughs> um, so if you're too close, you can get torn apart. Um, so planets can be um, tidally disrupted and um, um, broken up and then reformed. And we do probably have seen that that's happened in our own solar system. And um, so some of the um, kind of moons um, and, and um look like they've been kind of um, uh, disrupted, tidally reformed and, and um, melted together again and, and that. So it um, can be hugely disruptive to the, the, the integrity of the, the planet. Um, but even just on the, on the surface being that close, um, there's um, magnetic fields. Um, so again, that's hugely disruptive. Um, uh, magnetic storms, um, charged particles, and um, so the, the 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 surface is not so great. <laughs> um, yeah, um, which is what what um, what uh, um, John Brown's co colleague Rob Wilson had in the in the in that poem. Um, magnetic flares and stellar winds. Um, it's just a, an incredible thing to think that actually they are that close. Um, and they aren't totally disrupted. Um, so that the dynamics of that and the tidal friction, um, fascinating, um, um, which is part of why it's tidally locked um, and has, has various um, mechanical features and um, dynamical features that, that come into play. All right, thank you. Um... This talk has uh, generated a lot of interest. I'm seeing so many questions. Um, if you'd like, I'll just go through the questions for perhaps five minutes more and then uh, stop because you've already uh, been <laughs> having to talk for quite a long time. So I don't want to exhaust you. Um, but I encourage everyone to look uh, further into, uh, into this, but I will look at, at the next question here. Uh, if currently detectable exoplanets are generally large and or close to the sh their star, has anyone tried to extrapolate an estimation of the percentage of stars with exoplanets, including those that are undetected? And this is from Sinclair Curdy. Um, yeah, they've done that that kind of study, um, and it's they're you know really common. I'm just looking. Um, so a study was done like that for the Kepler mission, um, and um, and then more recently they revised it. Um, so I'm just looking to see. Um, from the Kepler data, to uh, see exoplanets oh too many pages of that it's it's definitely i do remember that um yeah what they do is they they look at um a kind of a statistical analysis of it and so you can extrapolate and um and see from the the the, the kind of fixed space that you were looking and exploring in, um, and then you um, um, extrapolate that to um, all the stars in the galaxy uh, and um, work out a calculation. Um, but it's 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 billions. <laughs> um, so exoplanets are um, here. Here we are. Right. Um, so this was a study of, um, yeah, so 24% of M-class stars may have habitable Earth-sized planets. 
Um, and so that's what they're getting from the um, Kepler data. Uh, and, um, and then if you look at all the M-class stars in the galaxy, um, then that equates to if 24% of them have habitable Earth-sized planets, then that equates to 10 billion potentially habitable Earth-like worlds. So. Thank you, that's a very big number. Yeah. <laughs> All right, great. Um, another question from John. Have they detected any biomarkers in atmosphere, such as ozone? Um, hmm. I'm, not, I'm not a chemist, um, astrochemist, so I don't know the answer, but I, I don't recall that. But I, I, I know I have a, a colleague that they're looking at all these kinds of markers. Um, I, I don't think, so ozone, oxygen, I, I don't think that's, that would be something that would be quite astounding, actually, because <laughs> that would be a, a, a marker, perhaps, of life. So I think, I think probably not. Um, um, All but, right, interesting. Uh, I would, I would, I would ask an astrochemist. <laughs> All right, fantastic. Um, and we're going to do just one last question, then it's the end of the line. Thank you so much. <laughs> um, from David Deegan, um, what about the possible detection of exomoons around large planets? Could tidal heating promote habitable environments? Thank you. Really good question. Um, I think that we we are actually exploring um, that that um, tidal heating. Um, so so yes, that would be a possibility. Um, there's all sorts of um, ways of um, generating heat um, through that kind of um, tidal friction, uh, and um, so exomoons of exoplanets. Um, we haven't detected any <laughs> yet. That's even smaller. <laughs> um, but yes, um, that that would certainly be something to explore. Um, uh, I'm, I'm thinking more in um, our own solar system. So actually people exploring that where you've got um, tidal friction um, and um, potential of life um, yeah. like EO. Um, yeah. And, and uh, Europa. Yep, and Europa, exactly. Uh -huh. So, yeah, very much. Um, thermal vent systems, similar to that. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah. So fascinating. I, I think you know. Again, it's not it's not the standard heating that that we need to mm -hmm. be looking at, but all these different possibilities. Uh -huh. So we actually, our exploration of our solar yeah. system. Um, and and that kind of life signature um, is one of the next most exciting yeah. things too. <laughs> yeah, life outside the Goldilocks zone. Yeah. Yes, mm -hmm. exactly. <laughs> yep. Oh my gosh, the possibilities thanks, would be thanks, endless. Bonnie, thanks a lot. Mm -hmm. <laughs> talk as well. Thanks. Good. Well, thank you so much. Um, Julian said uh, that if we could have a list of URLs or like maybe like a website that you could um, uh, send to us afterwards, we can share it on social media and the website and then this way everyone can do further research um, okay. into this when you have the time. Yeah. Um, but yeah, thank you so much. That was incredible. I'll definitely rewatch it. Uh, since it's been recorded. Um, I'll encourage everyone to subscribe uh, to our YouTube channel as well. This way you'll be notified for next time, next time we have a lecture. Um, more specifically, the next one is about the importance of studying wee little creatures in space. Um, so that sounds very interesting and we'll be going more into the chemistry of things, I'm assuming, um, this way. But that was amazing. Thank you so much. Um, and have a good night, everyone, and see you soon. Thank okay. you. Thank you. <laughs> Bye.